Hello, I'm Bill O'Donnell, and welcome to another program on spirituality. Uh, today we have a very a special program for you today. It is the story of a young woman's journey to Islam. I've wanted to do this for some time uh, during the current crises that we're experiencing in the world today. I felt it's very important for us as Americans, particularly in the West, to help to better understand the whole faith of Islam and not be overly swayed by the negative impressions that we get from the newspapers and television. So to that end, I've invited Karima Diane Alavi, the program director at Dar es Salaam, the mosque in Abiquiu, New Mexico, uh, to come in and share with us her story on how she found her way to Islam, and perhaps we'll learn something as well. So welcome, Karima. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Uh, in preparing for this program, uh, it, was, it was just wonderful to meet her. Uh, she is the program director for the Teacher Institute at Dar es Salaam in Abiquiu. And if you've never been there, it's a fabulous, fabulous place, fabulous location. We would probably think of it more in terms of Georgia O'Keeffe country, because very near uh, the mosque is where Georgia O'Keeffe did most of her famous painting. Is that correct? Yeah, she actually painted on our property. Oh, isn't that great? A lot of okay. Yeah. So, anyhow, welcome to Spirituality TV. Thank you. Um, most of our shows have been in the Judeo Christian vein for the most part. So, then this so is, is this one. And this one, too. <laughs> right. I'm glad you pointed that out. So, yeah. uh, tell us a little about your background and uh, how you found your way to Islam, starting as a little girl. <laughs> as a little girl. I grew up in Cleveland and I attended a church that I call sort of a generic Protestant church. It wasn't Lutheran, it was, it was just called Broadway Christian Church. And got into the habit of punctuating the week. Every Sunday you get up and you go to church. So as when I was little, that's what we did. You got up and you went to church every Sunday. And um, as I got older, that just kind of drifted away for, with the whole family. I mean, if, I think if my parents had insisted, we probably would have gone. but. The whole family kind of drifted and we didn't do it as I reached my teenage years. But I realize now as I'm older and as I'm studying Islam, because Islam really demands a lot of you in terms of studying. And as I'm studying Islam, I'm reminding myself of things that I had already known that were sort of buried deep down there that I had just forgotten. So these Bible lessons that I attended when I was a young kid that I thought, oh, this is silly and this is a waste of my time, you know, because there was an element of arrogance there as a child. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, what good is this doing me? And now that I'm older, these things click. And I'm, I've taught religion classes in Washington, mm -hmm. and I was amazed at how little the students knew about Christianity. So when I was teaching a course on Islam, much to my surprise, I had to begin with the Judeo-Christian tradition and then move on to Islam as a continuation of the Judeo-Christian tradition. You explain that. A lot of people, I don't think, understands that it comes right out of the Judeo-Christian yeah. tradition. Yeah, well, I'd said to you before, if you're going to read the Quran, you better know your Bible. Yeah. Because it, the Quran has 25 different prophets in it that are biblical prophets as well. So you're looking at the Old Testament and New Testament sort of as a foundation. And the Quran itself says, this is nothing new. This is a, we are reminding you, God is reminding you of what I've told you before and that and it refers to the forgetfulness of humans, you know, that I gave you this revelation and you forgot it and I'm giving it to you again. This is your last chance. So the Prophet Muhammad is considered what we call the seal of the prophets. And the Quran even has a verse in there about all these prophets that have come before that we make no distinction amongst them except for the fact that the Prophet Muhammad is the final one. So it's, there's an element of timeliness. So when you're reading the Quran, you're getting this thing of time. <laughs> Think about your time and how you're using it and what you're doing with it because this is it. You know, this is the end of the revelation. But what, I, what drew me to Islam was the universality of it all because it talks about Moses, Jesus, Abraham, the Virgin Mary is discussed more in the Quran than she is in the Bible. And she even has a chapter, chapter 19 of the Quran is called Maryam, which is the Arabic word for Mary. And it's about the virgin birth of Isa, which is the Arabic word for Jesus. So it's, you know, a lot of people have this tendency to think that we're so different from the Judeo-Christian religion. 
and they don't realize it's an Abrahamic faith. We trace our roots right back to Abraham just like Judaism yeah. and Christianity does. Yes, yeah, say a few words about that. I think a lot of people miss that point that Abraham is the father of all three. All three. Yeah. Well, th one of the things I do as part of my job besides directing a teachers institute at Darul Islam for educators, I also critique textbooks. And one of the, there are certain things that we really look for. And one of the sentences we catch like that and we call the, the, the publishers on it is they'll say the Judeo-Christ or the Abrahamic, the Abrahamic faiths, Judaism and Christianity believe yada yada yada. And we're going, hello, <laughs> you've left out one third of the Abrahamic faiths here because Abraham had the son Ishmael and the son Isaac and Judaism and Christianity traced their roots to Isaac and the Muslims including the Prophet Muhammad came directly from the line of Ishmael. So we are what is referred to in a lot of books as blood brothers is, is a term that you'll see a lot. But it's very strongly an Abrahamic faith. Yeah. So going back to your childhood, again, how did that, the transition as you kind of drifted away as so many you know, Christians do, they just drift away from the faith that they were exposed to as a child. I think everybody, I mean, we have that yeah. problem with Muslim youth as That's well. That's true, yeah, it's kind they of. Drift. But that was also the 60s too, wasn't it? Yes. So there was other things going on that, in oh, yeah. the old oh, yeah. famous 60s. So tell us what happened for you at that time. Um, I really sort of left the whole, I wasn't thinking about Islam, or about religion. I wasn't thinking about it. And one of the things that I like, I have a disc with the um, Quran on it and I did a word search and I hit the word reflect. And 221 hits came up. So this book tells me 221 times to think. So I wasn't thinking. I was, it was just not, you know, it was not even on my radar screen in terms of religion at so all. So if you're not thinking about God, yeah. you're not thinking. Yeah, yeah. According to the Quran, if, yeah. if God isn't central in your life, mm -hmm. you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. And again, there's a lot in here about what are you doing with your time. And there's a lot in the Islamic faith about uh, forgetfulness mm -hmm. and what's called the dunya. There's the, the Arabic word for the world around us, which is a world of distractions. Mm -hmm. is, we refer to that as the dunya. And it's saying, are you thinking about the worldly things, you know, my car payments, I'm going to do this, I want to buy this, I want to buy that. The greed, there's a lot there about greed and temptation. And there's a whole um, chapter in the Quran, I think it's chapter 102, I call it the stuff verse, the stuff chapter. <laughs> it's, it's about accumulation of stuff. And it just says, if that's where your attention has gone during this life, you've wasted it. That this life was a gift to you. And if you have spent it accumulating stuff, you blew it. It's a very short verse, but it just says, you blew it. I'm going right to my storage <laughs> locker after this show. Okay. Uh, and so many of us have. We, we just get caught up in it. Mm -hmm. So you too, yeah. at one time when you were a young woman, you know. Yeah, I was just more involved yeah. with this world instead of the right. divine world. I mean, yeah. There's this whole divine reality that I wasn't even aware of, and it's embracing us. It's around us all the time. Right. But I wasn't thinking about it. Right. I wasn't noticing it. But there were a lot of things going on to distract you as a young, impressionable person. You went to Kent sure. State, right, as an oh, undergraduate. Yeah. So during the 60s, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot happening there oh, at that time. So what were your experiences then? Um, I actually went to Kent after the shootings. But it's, a, as many people know, a very politically active campus, mm -hmm. um, strongly feminist at the time as well. and. Um, I'll go into the politics, but don't let me forget the feminist part, because okay. I want to do that too. But in terms of the politics, I was on campus during the time when there were also protests against the bulldozing of the hill that was so important in terms of the legal issues there. Okay, what she's referring to at that time, there was a major event where the National Guard was called on to Kent State, I believe, right around the Tet Offensive or 1968. and. Unfortunately, how many four, how many, four, four students were shot dead by our, the United States and National Guard on a peaceful, relatively peaceful rally well, of some kind. But <laughs> even if so, yeah. there, you know, it, were, there, and there was there was famous pictures killed. of that sort of thing, yeah. and people were killed. And that was that was a first. So that mm -hmm. was the tenor, and it made international news across the world. Oh yeah, yeah, May Fourth. Yeah, and then. Um, after that, years about 10 years after that, there was another protest that I then participated in because they were going to bulldoze, the university decided to bulldoze the hill on which the National Guard had stood when they were shooting people. And it was very, it, the um, whole thing still had not been settled in terms of the legal issues because the National Guard was heading up the hill 
and one young man who took a bullet in his spine was back there. So they're wondering why, if the National Guard's going this way, why was this guy killed over there? So it was really critical, and the university decided to bulldoze the hill and put up a gymnasium, and they did it. But we had protests and made this human block where we you know, sort of, it was interesting, where we linked arms and legs, and these guards had, National Guard came and picked us apart one by one and carried us off. It so is. that was well into the 70s at that point, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what did you study as an undergraduate? Well, let me get back to the okay. feminism part. All right, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wanted to mention something about that, because it was really interesting, because um, just yesterday, Sunday, Sunday I was going out somewhere, and I, it was a real outdoorsy thing, and I needed a pair of pants. And I thought, when's the last time I wore a pair of pants? And I thought, Kent State, blue jeans. But I realized at Kent State, that one of the things I started to do was to dress in a way that covered me up more as an element of feminism. That I started to think my body's my business and I'm not gonna allow you to judge me by my figure, my legs, the size of my chest, the shape of my legs. You're not gonna judge me by that. And so it was really interesting in the 1970s, the females at Kent State started wearing, sort of, sort of covering, it, covering up a lot and covering up their bodies as an element of feminism and taking away this right of males to judge us by our physical looks. So and interestingly, way down the road, yeah. when I started looking at Islam, that was something that just, I eased right into it because I thought, well, I've been doing that since, you know, back when the earth was cooling and I was at Kent State. <laughs> yeah, I thought, I've been doing this for decades. Yeah. And that is so true, isn't it? And that I mean, some people buy into that, women particularly, to be appreciated or to be thought better of or to advance or whatever it is that they're trying to address by using oh, absolutely. A, a, absolutely. attire and dress. Yeah. yeah. And, and so Islam, obviously, it might be a good time to tell us about the, the, the yeah. headdress and why you wear that as, as an extension of that. Yeah. Well, there's a verse in the Quran. Um, can I read it? Yeah, I want to sure. ask. It's, it's interesting. I'd have you... Um, See what I have you my notice Quran about it. Okay. Which one is All right. What's the that's verse? A, that's a Bible. Can I ask you something? As what? a Muslim, yeah. we're not supposed to put any books on top of a Bible or a Quran. Well, I did it intentionally so. symbolically <laughs> this time because, as you said, the Quran comes out of it. And so we'll yeah. do it right yeah. now, yeah. speaking of. Yeah, we're not supposed to put anything on top of the Bible. We, we both had agreed, and <laughs> I did it intentionally this time because this is what we both agreed. If you read this, this then. Quran will make more sense to you and that's how it happened for me and just by way of interaction this was given to me by Ahmed Kadri El Elu who was the religion educator at Dar es Salaam in 1986 when I visited there with the Interfaith Council of, of oh, Santa Fe okay. that was my first time there and and he gifted me this and moved me so much uh, you know, I don't know if you if you go to the, visit the Vatican, does anybody give you a Bible? I'm not sure. But if I went to Dar es Salaam, <laughs> somebody gave it to me, and that's why I read it. So thank you. Amen. Okay. Please go on with the reading. Okay. Here's the verse. Okay. Okay. What is it? D it's ch it's on Nur. It's chapter 24. Mm -hmm. The it's called the light, but it's chapter 24. Okay. Go ahead, and I'll just and catch up. And it's verse what? 30. Okay. Okay. Because I want to see if you notice anything here. Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and to be mindful of their chastity. This will be most conductive to their purity, and verily God is aware of all that they do. And tell the believing women to lower their gaze and to guard their modesty, and not to display their charms in public beyond that which may decently appear thereof. Hence, let them draw their head coverings over their bosoms, and let them not display more of their charms to anyone but their husbands, their fathers, and then it goes on, a whole list of male relatives. And always, believers, all of you, turn unto God in repentance so that you might attain to a happy state. That's it. And that, has that been your experience? Oh, yeah. So you yes. actually, it's one thing to read it, and then it has, once you've done that, it has made a difference yeah. in your life. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It's interesting because I was thinking about it. I actually like to wear the full veil. I went to Iran in October. And I hadn't been there for 25 years. And I put on the, what's called the chador. It doesn't cover my face. But I found myself actually using it to cover my face as well. Because I felt this sort of, it's almost like stepping onto a prayer rug, but you're stepping into it. You know, you're putting this prayer over you. And I love wearing the full veil. 
because I can just sort of flow. It's almost as if you've got this little cocoon of, of sanctity around you. And you're walking through a world that's very profane, let's face it. Yeah. And yet you've got this little cocoon of sanctity wrapped right around you. Uh -huh. Now, I don't wear it in the United States because I think it's too much for here. But I, as I said, I've dressed modestly since I was a student at Kent State. Yeah. But what's interesting about this, what I wanted to point out, is that very first sentence. Because there's two things here that are very important. Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and to be mindful of their chastity. Mm -hmm. So this starts with the men first. Yeah. And the important thing here, it's interesting because when non-Western, I'm sorry, non-Muslims look at this, they focus on the dress, the dress, the dress, the veil, the veil, the veil. We look at this and focus on three words, lower their gaze. To us, that's the heart of that verse because it tells us to behave modestly, speak modestly, not only dress, but to live modestly. Right. And get that nose on the ground. You know, get, it, get it out of here, get it on the ground. Yeah. So it says lower your gaze. Right, but I also, I think it's important to note that make for greater purity for the men. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. it's to protect them in some ways yeah. that you do it. Yeah. And yet I sense from you a freedom in that. Oh, absolutely. There's a protection absolutely. of men and then a freedom for you, <laughs> yeah, which absolutely. I don't think really comes across often in the media. No, no. People see it as oppression. Yeah. And I see Britney Spears as an oppressed human being. Oh, I understand. I mean, I'd look at her and i think, my God, you poor thing. You know, you're selling yourself. Yeah. You know, I mean, she's pretty and she knows it. And she has a nice figure and she knows it. And I'm looking at that and thinking she's completely sold herself out on that. And this is what's becoming right. a role model for young girls right now, which right. is also kind of scary. Because my question is, what happened to the women's lib movement? What, you know, we fought for a lot. And it's almost as if the young girls are reverting backwards and asking to be judged by their physical beauty or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And it's like we've gone backwards from where we were in the 1970s when the whole women's lib thing started. Yeah, why do you think that is? Just the media is promoting yeah, that? Yeah, I think it's being promoted. Uh -huh. you know, and you've got Britney Spears, Britney Spears. You don't have so-and-so who's an astronaut, and this one's a right. professor, and this one's a physician. You have Britney Spears is pretty, and you should be like that. So that's the role model that's being presented, and it's, I think it's a real step backwards. I hear it. Well, we, we're going to lose the rest of your story. How then from where you came from Kent State, then I understand you took a scholarship to go to Iran. Mm -hmm. And tell yeah, us about yeah, that. That was a real turning point for me. I received a bicentennial scholarship. It 1976. Was 76. Okay. <laughs> exactly. And the Shah gave 10 scholarships to the United States. So I got one of those 10 scholarships. And I studied at the University of Shiraz, which is in the southern part. And I hadn't, at that point even, I still wasn't even converting to Islam, but I was certainly observing it and watching a certain, it's a very formal culture, very formal. And their behavior, their dress, the way they treat each other. And I just saw a real dignity in all of this. And I was, observing. <laughs> that was about it. And studying. I studied the language and, um, and the history and the art history and the architecture, that sort of thing. And came back to the United States and I ended up marrying an Iranian, a professor at Kent State. And um, we went back in 78 to teach. I taught at the University of Esfahan. And the revolution broke out six days after we arrived. Wow. So we had six days of peace and quiet, and then the revolution started. And what was interesting to me is, um, you know, the, uh, very few people realized that the Shah was actually the Shah of Iran, who was a brutal dictator, had already been overthrown. And the United States, CIA, Operation Ajax under Kermit Roosevelt, put him back in power, which no country is going to appreciate. <laughs> you know, if, we, if we impeach a president and somebody else comes in and says, no, 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 and puts the guy back in power, we're not going to be happy campers. So when I went in 76, it felt like there, there's just this pot ready to boil, just ready to blow. And when I got there in 78, it just blew. And it was very interesting to me because at that point, what I really saw was an element of um, liberation theology in action. And we have a tendency to think of liberation theology as something that's only, that only the Catholics do in South America. And when you see the same exact thing, people turning to their faith to fight against oppression, we call it terrorism or fanaticism, or, you know, all those crazy nutcases over there in the Middle East. And I realized they're doing the same thing, exactly the same thing. And yet you had not converted at this no, point yet. No, uh-uh. So what was it like being American in the middle of this? Whoa. <laughs> um, at first, I never 
I never felt threatened by the Iranians, although they were rude to me at times, but not physically attacking me at all. The only time I was actually in danger, I almost got shot twice, and that was by American bullets coming out of Sikorsky helicopters that the U.S. had sold to the Shah. So the closest I came was the Shah's troops killing me. And what they would do is take the women, the one time when I was out on the street, they took the women and children and put us under the trees so that the bullets would, would be absorbed by the branches, and the men stood out and took the bullets while the women and the children stood under the trees. How many people were killed at that time? Uh, thousands. 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 Oh, yeah. There were 200 that day that I was under, uh, just on that street. The, what, see, the Sikorsky that helicopter can turn around. Oh, yeah. 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 And the Sikorsky is very um, efficient because it turns like this. So you don't have, the crowd doesn't have time to scatter. So because they know it's just going to do this and just gun you down. And it's mounted with helicopters. So these were Iranian pilots these under were Iranian the Shah. Iranian pilots under in the American Shah equipment. in American equipment. Ameri yes, Korskis that we had sold. And there was a U.S. Yeah. Um, helicopter base oh. in Esfahan, the city I lived in. Yeah. So when you came back to the states after this, what happened next in your life? I started teaching. Actually, I kind of drifted into um, Quaker education. I went to Sidwell Friends School. I finished my master's, and then I went into Sidwell Friends School in Washington D.C. and they asked me to teach a course. They were the tenth grade curriculum was being sort of divided up into regions, which is something I don't like to do because I feel you're you're spreading apart. You're acting as though Africa has no relationship to Latin America, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. If you're teaching one guy's teaching Africa, one's teaching Latin America. Mm -hmm. Another one was teaching Asia, and they asked me if I would teach the Middle East, and I said no. I said I will teach a course called Peoples and Cultures of the Islamic World. And they said, why would you call it that? And I said, well, I can go from China to Detroit. Uh, and I'm still teaching peoples and cultures of the Islamic world. And so I wanted to look much at more the relevant. links. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to make it a course with links, not separations. Okay. And so I went there and started teaching. And um, actually, when I, I had also taught, before the, even before that, I taught at Wilmington College in Ohio, which is a Quaker school. And at that point, I started going back to church again at Wilmington College and started attending the Quaker churches. And it was actually a very easy step to go from Quakerism into Islam. Why? Why is that? Lots of similarities. <laughs> For <laughs> instance, really give us an example. Um, simplicity in the service. Mm -hmm. And there's this attitude that there's nothing between me and God. You know, there, if, you, if you go into some church services, there's, you have to sort of go through the priests, the ministers, this sort of thing. Within a Quaker service and within an Islamic service, there's really not that sort of veil between you and the divine. It's, uh -huh. it's a direct line. Right. And it's a very simple uh, religion and simple services, which I liked. And then also within the Quaker tradition, there's a lot in there about social justice. And that also, I started seeing the similarities because I just saw social justice, social justice right here. And I saw it in the Quakerism and I saw it in this. And it was actually a very easy transition. Simple living, I, I love the um, George Fox quote, live simply so others may simply live. I mean, every night when I turn on, I don't have a TV. <laughs> I was going to say every night if I had a television, but when I see the TV and see what's on the TV and I look at it, and I think if that could just be our mantra, uh -huh. live simply so others may simply live, yeah. we'd be turning the TV on and watching some very pleasant things. Okay. So tell us now, what happened? Where did you make from being a similar to practicing Quaker in a way, to, mm -hmm. to Islam. What, what was yeah. the shift? What happened? How did that occur? The shift actually happened in Abiquiu in 1994. Coming I, here? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, this is something that had been ta you know, taking 20 yeah. years, really. 20 I mean, years. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't yeah. jumping th right. ahead. Yeah. And, um, How did you come here? I came here to participate in the Teachers Institute on the first year. It was 1994. As a and participant, as a participant, in the program. yeah. As, so you were a teacher, and you took advantage of this program. Yeah. Now you're the director. Uh, of it. Now I'm the director of it. Yeah. Uh, okay, go ahead. I came in '94. I was assistant director in '95 and director in '96. So I just sort of, you know, went up the ladder that way. Yeah. But it was in '94 when I got away from the distractions. I mean, that's what's interesting. Again, Islam keeps saying, "Watch out for the distractions." There's a whole lot out there that's pulling you in different ways, and your attention should be on the divine. And when I got up to Abiquiu and that mountain and the stars and the sky, and I said, that's it, no more TV, no more radio. <laughs> I, I was in um, Thailand recently, and my son was describing my life, and the people said to him, why doesn't she just become a Buddhist monk? <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting, because he said, she doesn't have a TV, she doesn't have radio. And I have a CD, but I literally forget, a CD player, I forget it's there. 
So I live in a silent house. So when I got to Abiq and I was sort of placed in this setting where there's no, no distractions, suddenly I thought, whoa. And that was it. That was it. But so. where was the, the what was that moment? I mean, all of a sudden to give up your Christian heritage and then to but embrace I didn't give Islam fully. I, didn't, so you, I mean, it's not, Mary, it's not Jesus, a, it's not Moses, it up. Yeah. Abraham. So you consider it you consider a progression yeah. in a way. Yeah, I just took a next step. Yeah. That's all. What but does that's one have to do mistake, then to become? Because people think you know that you're giving yeah, it up, and right. you're not. You're just moving on a little bit more. Okay. So what what is the what is the procedure then to okay. convert to yeah. Islam? The first pillar of Islam is called the Shahada or the Declaration, uh -huh. and you just declare yourself with witnesses. You grab a couple people and you say in front of people, La ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah, which is there's no deity but God which means that you are a very strict monotheist from this time on. And, and then that, the prophet Muhammad is, that Muhammad is a prophet of God. But inferred in that is he's the seal of the prophets. Again, as I had said, there's even a verse in here that says, yeah. we believe in, and it goes Joseph, you know, Joseph, Abraham, Moses, Isa, and it goes on and on. And we make no distinction amongst them. So you'd already read the Quran by now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was teaching with the Bible and the Quran in uh, Washington. Yeah, and then just by doing that, that's all it is. Yeah. That's yeah. great. That's interesting. Yeah, and getting wow. rid of the distractions. Wow. Just two things. Well, yeah, there's a lot to go. be learned in that whether you're <laughs> going to, you know, become Muslim or not. But, um, uh, well, that's fabulous. So uh, we just want you to know that those of you who are viewing at home, uh, this is coming to the end of part one. And we hope that you will come back next week and watch the second half of this interview with Karima about the teacher training program, about more of her experience in northern New Mexico in Abiquiu at the mosque and what she has learned there. And then even more importantly, what you at home or others can learn through their teacher training program, particularly for high school teachers who are teaching young people about Islam if they're bombarded constantly with the newspaper and television about uh, Ex extremists here and there around the world and our fight with them that's not necessarily the truth and we want you to know more about Islam for yourself and that's what this program is designed to do so that if your children are going to school somewhere in this country and don't have any experience their teachers have no experience with Islam mm -hmm. they can't very well teach it if they haven't read the Quran if they don't know what it really means and they may not be getting the whole story and I think it's so important for us to know the whole story, to know about Islam. So after you've read the Holy Bible, you're going to want to pick this up. I found it a fascinating read, and we're going to talk more about that next week. So thank you for viewing on part one, Karima. Please stay around, and we'll invite you to come next week for the second half of Karima's journey into Islam and to learn more about the teacher training program at Dar es Salaam in Abiquiu, New Mexico. So on behalf of everybody here at Spirituality TV, I'm Bill O'Donnell. Thank you for viewing, and stay tuned next week for part two of the journey to Islam. Thank you.